Awesome. So can I just have a round of applause for all of our panelists that have been great enough? Well, let's just introduce them all. So Michelle and Angelina are going to be grouped together. And we've got Brett and Kylie. There we go. Nice. <laughs> and Catherine and Isabel. Nice. Ten. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Our first question. All right. So that's my question. There's been a competition happening up here already. All right. So our first question. So how important... For me, I think it's incredibly important, but we need to be intentional about when and where. So um, one of the problems we have in education sometimes, and maybe you've noticed this, is that we do sometimes go all or nothing. Like we're really good at the, like, let's just completely ban it or let's bring it into every classroom. Um, the secret sauce is making sure that we're very, very clear about when we're teaching it and why we're using it so that we can model, firstly, intentional use of technology, um, that we're in control of um, what, when we're doing it, what information we're putting into it, what we're trying to achieve. And we're intentional about when we actually want to develop skills that the technology might take away from. So when do we need the human side? When do we need to make sure that we've got those foundational skills so that later when we're driving the technology, we can be an expert as well? So I think like not teaching it is a huge mistake. Teaching it in every class is a huge mistake. Balancing it, it's a tricky thing to do, but that's where we need to aim as um, an education industry. Perfect, thank you so much for that. Um, I think that using generative AI in school is something that's really important to teach students as it's gonna be part of their daily lives when they're older. And one way that I think I've done that in school already is um, I take PDM, which is like a digital media class, and here we had to do a film where we use generative AI clips to create like scenes for our film. And for this, we actually had to create the prompts themselves on a program called Runway. And we tweaked it using like um, kind of prompt making techniques to make sure that we could properly like create the vision that we wanted to. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. Can I ask as someone who's used Runway, um, how long did it take for you to develop the thing you had in your head? Did it end up looking like what you expected it to? I think that, I mean, it really depended on how strong my vision was for some scenes. Like, for example, there were some very specific scenes and it took definitely a couple tries to tweak the prompts and make them exactly how I wanted to. But other times when I wasn't quite sure exactly what I wanted, but I had a general idea, it was really nice to let the AI do some of the work and kind of add in their own elements that I didn't really expect. Mm. Fantastic. Next question. I've got a team leader at the back here. Um, with AI, already, oh, sorry, this is from Brett and Kylie. Sorry. Warning. You ready? With AI already influencing many industries, what would you say to critics who argue that schools are lagging in preparing mm -hmm. students for this AI? I'll kick off. Um, what do we say about schools are lagging? I think actually, uh, if we ask the question, uh, who, who pays for the concept of schools? Like, why do we even have uh, the concept of, of, of school? Like, who pays for it? Like, we've got our politicians and all that sort of stuff. Um, does anybody want to have a crack at a guess as to um, this year, this financial year? Well, well, this financial year, this financial year, how much roughly did the federal government spend on education? Just, you know, 128 billion, Australia. 128 billion dollars uh, on, that's, that's this year's budget. And that's just the federal government, that's not all the states adding up. So we have a significant investment into the concept of school. So 
as teachers, if I said if I said to, to our students and fellow teachers, like, why, why do we do school? Obviously, you know, we, we, we want to make a difference. We want to change lives. Uh, we, we want to make a caring place for for um, our, the, the children in our care who don't always have a caring place at home. We want all these beautiful, wonderful things. Like, as, as teachers, you know, we wear our hearts, like, on our sleeves. But the people who pay the bill, why are they paying the bill? What do they see at the concept of school? What are they purchasing? What is $128 million a year, a billion dollars a year purchase uh, for Australia? Well, we're buying uh, a, a quality education because if your population is highly educated, they're more likely to get highly paid jobs. Highly paid jobs uh, mean we have higher tax revenue. Higher tax revenue means we can put money into the government. Money into the government means we can pay for our health, we can pay for our infrastructure, we can pay for our schools, we can pay for our police and keep ourselves safe. It is an investment in the jobs of the future so Australian people could be better educated so we can get those highly paid jobs. Now, we go back to that question, what do you say? Well, I don't think anyone here, and, 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 I, and I'll say over to Catherine, there's no way that we could even pretend to say that if the whole concept of school is to, the reason why we pay that much money is to buy or purchase or invest in the jobs of the future so that we can have these highly paid jobs for our students and our next generation, AI is going to be part of the jobs of the future. So if we are paying something, we are purchasing the concept of school so that we could teach our children, train our children so they can have those highly paid jobs, and we know that AI is going to be part of those highly paid jobs, then it is very, very commonsensical that we would make sure that we have the appropriate AI training and learning and, and, and use cases, the sorts of things that Michelle was talking about happening at Halery, so that we can have our, our, our students uh, prepared for those jobs of the future. There you go. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. Um, I think, like, especially as my own personal experience when I have been introduced to like generative AI and like using it like I noticed that the language to use generative AI is like completely different to like what I used to learn like because when you put in a prompt to um, visualize what you have in your head it's we're used to using these very descriptive and like roundabout ways like using metaphors and stuff but um, when when we work with like computer AIs um, some, most of the time, like, they don't really understand that and they take everything really literally. So, um, like, having to learn this new skill of, like, completely banishing, like, these roundabout ways to describe things, it was definitely a challenge. And having schools, like, not be constantly and, like, effectively imp imp implementing this into our school curriculum, it, it can get really hard when... AI, because it's rapidly changing and like changing our world and it's being incorporated slowly by slowly and slowly. Um, when it's when we don't learn this skill set, it, it gets really hard for us to actually adapt and learn to use these skills to like to its fullest potential, because um, our, our main goal is to like use this technology to create a better world and make better things. So I think schools should be like putting in a little bit more effort instead of like running away from it because I mean it's kind of inevitable that AI will be in our society and in what we do so mm. Woo -woo! Right. Um, how do you envisage using gen AI to enhance student learning and engagement in the future and what challenges do you anticipate would you like me to go first I will not for you okay I've got my mic, so you can hold on to that one. Um, okay. One of the things that I see being really important around this is you don't just do AI in a STEM classroom, for example. When we're looking at the moment, I've been writing some papers recently on the future of the fashion industry. And did you know a third of all the world's wastewater directly comes from textile industry? So producing unwanted textiles is really bad for the environment. And one of the things that happens in the fashion industry is that you produce samples and so you're producing versions and versions and versions of things before someone finally chooses the one that they want and then they start to make them. Now, anyone who teaches any form of home economics, textiles, fashion design might think that generative AI is going to be a problem for the fashion industry because it's going to be a way in which people can just design what they want and maybe fashion designers aren't going to mean anything anymore. 
On the contrary, fashion designers are loving it because what it means is working with it in a dyad form, like I mentioned earlier, they're able to produce these samples without producing samples. We've all already got digital um, twin mirrors of people so that you can stand in front of something and think that you're wearing it, but you're not wearing it, but you can see what it looks like on you. You know, that actually accurate measurement. So everything is kind of bespoke made just for you. Um, and so this idea that AI and generative AI is being used to help fight environmental issues rather than just being part of that environmental issue problem is really powerful. And people aren't talking about this enough because they're not applying it to the thing that it's being applied to already in the real world. That's just the fashion industry. So let's just put it there. That's just the fashion industry. Imagine all of the other industries that are worth billions and billions and billions of dollars. The space industry, the cosmetics industry, Hollywood, you know, games, the gaming industry is worth more than movies, media and music combined. The games industry has jumped on generative AI in such a huge way. And even now, the movie industry is going to allow you to do a choose your own adventure. Do you remember those books which were choose your own adventures? So you're going to be able to choose the way you want that movie to end. Do you want them to get together because you're feeling that way inclined? Or have you just gone through a bad breakup so you want them to never get together? Um, you know, or do you want the, the secret friend to come out and be the love interest? Or do you want the person to you know, get to Mars or not get to Mars? We're going to have a way in which we can put personal preference on things. The thing is, though, sometimes when I go to the movies, I don't go to hear what my personal preference is on things. I become in an echo chamber of myself. I want to go and experience what a director's vision of this story was. That choice will still be there. And I guess the thing that I would like to see in ethics conversations is when do we choose to use the generative AI and when do we not? But recognizing the power of that outside of the STEM sphere um, across all parts of our life, I think, is something we need to do more. I think from a learning perspective as well, it's kind of very mirrored of that. It's kind of the mimicry of that is very prevalent, I would say, in my own experience. Um, just as kind of a point, I think it's very important to acknowledge that AI should not be used as the whole of something. I think that it's really important to make sure that we're teaching our students that AI is a wonderful tool, but it should not be generating a whole thing. It's really important that it's a basis of something that they can then further their understanding of that thing or build on it. Um, use it to create original ideas and then build on them. Um, I think a challenge that in the classroom, purely in a classroom environment, obviously there is the kind of obstacle that it's not going to be 100% accurate all the time. It will never be um, accurate and that can be improved in the future and optimized, but I think right now it's really important to acknowledge that that is not, nothing should be taken as 100% fact. Um, mm. As well, I think it's really important to acknowledge that the way AI works, it's compiling the most common tokens and it's spitting them out back at you as kind of an amalgamation of something that everybody else has said. And in that way, originality is not possible. It's everything it's an amalgamation of everything that is out there on the internet and it's compiled in that format for you. And I think in an education environment, creativity obviously is such an important part of education. And yeah, in that way, I think it's really important for students to know and learn that AI can never produce original ideas. I mm -hmm. think there is always a place for original thought in everything that you do. I love that. I just wanna add very quickly. I love that, but if I get the chance to like scan myself, like the 22-year-old version of myself, and go back to the Point Break movie with Keanu Reeves in, and put myself in instead of Laurie Petty, I am going to do that. Okay, <laughs> I will. All right, we're <laughs> just time, um, so. conscious of time, so I think you have a question. No, I've got one here, but we're not very good. Um, I'm Julie Fowler from Taking South Wales, and I have a question for the wonderful students who spoke and answered those questions today. How amazing are you for our future? Um, I wanted to get your opinion on the ban of social media for under 16, under 14. What are your thoughts? All right, can I flip that then? If you were to be told by your parents that the social media ban is in place as of tomorrow, what would be your, your reaction to that? Um, I think it would definitely come as a bit of a shock. Um, I use, uh, I'm, I'm, I have a Google phone, so um, group chats aren't really possible for me through like um, messages. 
So I find that I use Instagram most to communicate with my friends and my family and create group, chat, group chats on there. So I think that from that perspective, using social media as a way to connect with friends and family is really powerful. But when it comes to seeking out other things, it can be a great source of inspiration. But I think that we do sometimes get in our heads about it. So I'd say there are definitely pros and cons to it being banned for under 16 under 16 year olds yeah um also completely agree i just like to add i think there's always two sides to it um obviously yeah it can be a great way to connect with people that you do and don't know and obviously the it's very social media oriented oriented in our society today but i think there is also a point to be made that it can reinforce harmful imagery or maybe you know if you're like observing everybody doing perfect things all the time, it can reinforce that idea that everything should be perfect. And that can be harmful to young people. But I think what's important is teaching them to recognize that. And yeah, I wouldn't say maybe a complete and total ban is the correct avenue, because like we saw with the prohibition in America, things just kept popping up. I mean, there will always be some form of social media, I think, because it's just so ingrained in our society, but yeah. Can I just a little follow-up question on that, I guess, from the school's perspective and your parents' perspective, right? And, and you mentioned you're looking at tech, right? So you are using things like Instagram, you are using TikTok, whatever you are, and those horrible, deep, dark places that you shouldn't be going that it takes you. Do you have an expectation that those, the schools, the teachers, the big tech will keep you safe? I mean, I, I'd say, like, especially if you're making a platform which will have various, like, uh, people of various ages, I think it's really important to make sure, like, before you actually start letting the public use it, it's, like, making sure that it's safe for children to use. And it's, like, of course, well, this is an issue that is definitely very prevalent currently with, like, the many things that are on the internet out there that's so easy to access for children. But um, I think, I, I know a lot, like many social media like companies are like trying to make it better, but I would say that it needs to be better quite, very fast because <laughs> children are like getting more and more into social media and it's getting easier and easier to slip into these like really scary places that they shouldn't be in. They could have, they could have done it a long time ago and they didn't want to do it because it's not how they make money. Could I, could I just ask very quickly, actually, like a few days ago, I put on my, my LinkedIn, it was my last question on, on LinkedIn, was like a little survey, because we were just having a, a little chat there. Is, is everybody aware that currently at the moment they are debating legislation for, um, is every, everyone's on that? So the Prime Minister at the moment goes like, the, there is a, a debate at the moment to bring in a, a, a social media ban, and they've got to work out the, the nuts and bolts of that. And I asked a question and I've only had a couple hundred um, uh, answers, but I was just curious, just a quick survey um, here, just a, a show of hands. If you were the committee deciding on, on, on how the band's going to operate and, and whatnot, just a, let's have a, a quick show of hands. Do, you, do we think 18 or, or, or younger, 16 or younger, 14 or younger, or, or, or maybe no band at all? Just out of curiosity, just a quick show of hands. Who Hands up who thinks uh, if the, we were going to bring in a, a social media band in Australia, 18 and younger? Couple, 16 and younger? Yeah, looks like, what's well, about 70%. 14 and under? Couple, looks like that's probably about 20 each percent. No ban at all? No ban at all. Yeah, about 10 or 15. So just at the little survey I'm doing at the moment online, I think we've got about 56, 57% saying um, 16 and under, and, and about 9% saying no ban at all with, with the other split um, just there. So. Actually, quite curious to, to, to see that the vibe in the room here, I'm um, mirroring, mirroring what sort of the, the uh, online conversation is. Back to you. But I want to add to what yeah. that, go, go. I'd love you to run the same server or ask the same questions again about who thinks the, the age of voting age should be 16. Because I actually think the voting age should be 16. I think I was politically savvy enough at age 16 to decide. Like in the UK, age 16, you can buy cigarettes, you can't buy lottery tickets, or could you buy, I can't remember. But it was like, 
you know, so if we're going to say we, we're going to allow them to access all these things at age 16, I'll be like, right, we'll give them the vote then. Really? Get behind a vehicle. Yeah, you can get behind a car. You can do so many things at 16. It's really interesting. All right, I'm going to go to Erin. Erin, do you have anything for us online? Yes, well, uh, there is the input that some people in the chat have talked about um, banning political mis or disinformation rather than a total ban. And Ben has the question, can most of our fears about AI in schools be fixed by better assessments that document the creation process of the end work? For example, provide high behind the scenes videos. Ooh, um, it's certainly documenting process and thinking is a big thing that um, we're trying to get in our assessments and one of the things that um, when there are questions about if AI has been used um, I'm encouraging our teachers to not just look at a, a tool telling us whether it's AI or not but rather that portfolio of development and work to see if it's a student voice or not because like 90% 90% of the time, um, students who do use AI, it doesn't come out in their voice. Um, however, a smart student wouldn't. I remember, would, uh, should I be giving tips about how I would use AI to generate work and get away with it? Um, anyway, moving on. Um, oh, would you? Well, the corporate world should I? I mean, the first thing I did was say, like, can you please insert grammatical errors and spelling mistakes? Analyse this text and rewrite it in the same tone of voice as this. Oh, no, I shouldn't be saying this aloud, should I? Um, but certainly um, we do have that looking at that process, and I think that is really important. The video behind it creeps me out completely, though. Um, one of the things that we do when we're learning is we make mistakes. And we need to be in a safe place to make mistakes without feeling judged. And I, it's one of the reasons that I said that I don't want our parents on Microsoft Teams um, with the students. And um, certain areas need to be safe learning spaces mm -hmm. where students can make mistakes and get feedback and can have messy thinking that they might later go, oh, gosh, did I really think that? Um, as an adult, I have those moments. I don't want someone necessarily um, looking at every single one of those. But documentation is and that portfolio process is a really good way of firstly valuing process the journey over the destination which um, is a lesson for us in life and in ceramics as well. <laughs> it's a lesson I took a long time to learn. I would have thought myself a perfectionist and realised it's not the end product because it's guaranteed going to change like two days later. Uh, so can we have a round of applause for all our panellists?